Next up, those same two Echo games we looked at earlier, this time on the Game Gear. Please refer to what I discussed regarding the Genesis, and to a lesser extent, CD, counterparts. Cause I'd rather drink an entire vat of Jägermeister mixed with Harbor Sealed Piss, Sulfur, and Hydrogen Cyanide than to mindlessly repeat myself, God damn it! Everything's once again ditto like their original Genesis and CD relatives, except not only limited to too much narrower and drastically amended stage-by-stage -stage itineraries by comparison, but to a more restricted control schematic. Case in point, the sonar is assigned to start in both offerings, with instant map access upon holding it, and buttons 1 and 2 are for the trademark charge packing and acceleration individually. The myriad of other changes many have discovered with both portable offerings, apart from what was originated in their console relatives one might add, seeing as they're modeled after their Master System counterparts, released only in both Europe and Brazil individually, namely all the key and barrier glyphs, even others containing songs, invincibility, etc. Surfaces and air pockets for oxygen recovery, countless sea life appearing as either allies or adversaries, depending on the situations in which Echo gets himself involved, are the blocks used for clearing off the hard spikes and fending off random ass shit for brains piranhas before proceeding, and the letter based passwords are now 5 digits in both titles instead of the traditional 8. As is the case in the aforementioned console parents, Echo starts out venturing through Medusa Bay following that chaotic ass leap of suspense in Chapter 1. <laughs> Following which we're introduced to the usual undercaves with the same old giant octopus and its lethal ass tentacle that strikes when you travel near his ass too goddamn quickly, plus the debut of the starfish circle that deteriorates the stone walls. Then there's Ridgewater, involving the rescue of a trapped dolphin, and the shark infested open ocean, leading up to cold water and deep water, featuring the respective debut appearances of Big Blue and the Asterite, who converse with Echo in the same manner as the Genesis and CD relatives. The City of Forever in Atlantis, where Echo defies every crystal trap before tracking down the time machine, which eventually warps his ass to Origin Beach in the prehistoric age. Featuring the usual traveling pteranodon, summoned instantly by the song he absorbs from an undersea glyph. Darkwater featuring the past corrupted incarnation of the asteroid, with the customary aim of pegging at the same colored globes, three of them instead of the traditional four to be precise. The revisitations to deep water, where one of the past asteroids globes is guided by Echo to bring to the present asteroid. City of Forever Atlantis to hop aboard and activate the very same time machine back to present day home bay. Reenacting that very same iconic suspenseful storm caused by his leap. And lastly, the three-part Vortex finale, the auto-scrolling tube, machine, and the last fight against the Vortex Queen herself, who, strangely enough, is lacking her vacuuming ability. I mean, shit! Way to push up the fucking challenge there, Sega, in association with Novitrade, aka Appalooza.
And regarding the tides of time, the real second quest commences when Echo feeds its mirror image of fish by guiding it nearby, which, for the record, responds in case he accidentally devours it. In the vents of Medusa, minus the jellyfish transformation, no less, complete with more than just the usual glyph searching routine, not to mention the starfish circles for disintegrating the ever loving shit out of the stone walls and the advice spewing killer whale. The maze of stone where Echo's powers from the asteroid are lost halfway through upon dodging a piranha, thus triggering the very same avalanche and the out-of-nowhere resurrection of the health and oxygen meters, akin to the fault zone in the Genesis version, no less. The Sea of Darkness, where the lights are displayed only when Echo sonars in the deeper region, and you're even entrusted to follow a baby orca straight to a warp gate portal. leading to the first of five pseudo-3D scenes where Echo has to wade through the rings above or below the ocean surfaces while keeping every foe at bay and or evading every common goddamn environmental threat. The Skyway and Tube of Medusa, where Echo traverses through the jelly-based patch mazes without deviating from them, and Echo can transform into a seagull upon being exposed to a collection of stars instead of the Metasphere, if only for a temporary fucking period, before facing and evading the dreaded Medusa jellyfish, which will approach his ass the whole time before reaching the next pseudo-3D scene. Following which, Echo reunites with the asteroid in its cave, after a brief underwater cavern getaway, involving the dispatch of all those punk-ass sharks and red moray eels, clearing off those same dirty-ass spikeros with the blocks, except the asteroid only reappears with two of its remaining globes, upon exterminating the last moray eel in the constantly descending spiked shell. A customary scavenger hunt for the asteroid's missing globes then commences in the eye, where there's only 14 lying around, which for the record, have to be gathered from scratch if Echo's ass perishes. Deep Ridge, which involves moving blocks around and stacking them whenever necessary, should any higher ground be nearby while pursuing and retrieving globes, not to mention the usual seagull transformation via stars, the sea of birds where Echo morphs into a random-ass vortex drone to reach both a wall, followed by a shark, and flat-out fuck him up without any remorse, before morphing back and following another baby orca all the way to the surface, leading to yet another comrade dolphin and a glyph, not to mention, oi motherfucking vey, another pseudo-3D warp ring scene. The auto-scrolling Vortex future, where your undeniably cunning, trusty reflexes, and razor-sharp instincts are key for guiding Echo throughout every unexpected turn, and should you happen to reach a block with four dots, do whatever the fuck's necessary to avoid trapping his ass, until reaching and conquering that enormous yet defiant as fuck piss-ant son-of-a-bitch globe holder that possesses the asteroid's final two globes, before resurrecting the latter once and for all, and shifting back to possessing infinite health and oxygen once more. The second convergence area, where an underwater block puzzle must be solved before, who could have expected anything less than yet another fucking pseudo 3D warp ring scene? Thank god it's only the fourth, and next to last one might add. The new machine, featuring the same ass ramming auto scrolling anarchy, akin to the vortex future area, where strict directions have to be followed, especially while passing through the Jesus fucking damn tubes, and coming face to face with the very same red vortex queen, with her guarding paralysis laser at the top, except minus her tongue and vacuuming ability, not to mention she's way more of a goddamn pushover than before. After which, Echo returns to home bay to celebrate and rejoins the asteroid as it advises him to yet again revisit Atlantis and its time machine via yet another random ass block puzzle upon enduring the fifth and final pseudo 3D warp ring scene. And it's about goddamn time, right? It would have also been a hell of a lot more invigorating to watch Godzilla descend far below the seas and unleash his trademark atomic breath upon all the Vortex drone jackasses, sharks, moray eels, Medusa jellyfish, and the like, while teabagging the Queen non stop, while Gazora, Mogera, Gigan, Destoroya, Hedera, Angras, and Biolante shove the globe holder up their collective asses. Being exposed to acid rain with Avenged Sevenfolds, this means war, playing in the fucking background. The customary rants aside, while the controls tend to be awkward at first, limitation-wise that is, though not as awkward as, say, Ross Geller from Friends, they're at the very least bearable and solid, likewise for the always compliant and apprehensible gameplay framework. 
challenge-wise, the Game Gear ports of both Echo titles are on about the same plateau as their console counterparts, but once again, pun definitely not intended, I wouldn't hold my breath in the least, because everything else can still be an extremely searing pain in the padded ass, with the obvious exception of all the boss confrontations with the Vortex Queen in both installments, and especially the quote-unquote armless globe holder in Ties of Time, not to mention the use of the Sonar's map to track down every important aid, including the usual key and barrier glyphs, air pockets, clams, fish schools, and the like. What is a drastic pain, however, are the block arrangement puzzles in Atlantis' A City of Forever, not only in the original, but in Tides of Time also, which take serious memorization and precision to nail, and should you happen to fuck up, you're free to swim away from them and restart, likewise for surviving while transformed into a seagull and or other organisms, and especially the primitive yet ambitious 3D areas and the scavenger hunts involving the retrieval of the asteroid's lost globes, which can be either a refreshing and positive blessing or an ignominious dreaded curse, and that most of the globe's echo returns to it are still intact, no matter how fast his progress is, and that Echo must repeat a certain stage should he get his ass handed back to him in a goddamn Tupperware dish. Getting back to the sonar map, and as much as I strongly believe in mastering every title fair and square, there's a special debug, invincibility, stage select, and coordinate warp code menu, complete with a sound test that can be accessed while on said map in both titles, and I'd press the following if I were you. Right, 1-2, 1-2, down 2, up, and the original Echo. and left, 1-2-1-2, two, one, two, down 2, up, in Tides of Time. Beyond that, everything else should be at least tolerable and by the numbers, like its console relatives, so for the very last time, refer to the tips I've provided for the first two Genesis titles. As primitive and horrendous as they appear to be, background-wise and hue-wise, the presentation for the Echo Game Gear duology is nothing short of sheer brilliance. Thanks to how each and every island, underwater landscape, and futuristic set is akin to those of its source material. Honestly, I wish I could express the exact same about Tides of Time, in terms of how washed out the choice of hues are, especially in their own mazes and auto-scrolling scenes, with the obvious exception of the 3D areas. Echo by himself, in addition to all the supporting and opposing organisms alike, minus the Vortex larva in the case of Tides of Time, is replicated meticulously from their console counterparts, notwithstanding how awkward and chavvy the sonar waves appear every time he calls out. Either way, the entire kit and caboodle, that is the graphical quality of both games, is at least adequate and faithful, despite the evidence as all get-out technical limitations. In terms of music and sound, orchestrated for both installments by Shaba Gigor and Gabor Foltan, with Laszlo Fazikas joining them for Tides of Time, this unexpectedly different variety of tracks, with all due respect for the aforementioned composers responsible, are beyond underwhelming, as most of what the first portable installment offers feature renditions of select songs from and based on its Genesis counterpart, including the Island Zone theme used for the title and Ridgewater. Even the credits theme for Open Ocean. with a handful of port-exclusive originals, and the less I express about Tides of Time, considering the majority of that certain follow-up's original tracks are somehow unfamiliar yet sufficing, albeit astronomically abysmal, likewise for the limited sound effects in both offerings, including but strictly not limited to, pun not intended, the digitized whale and dolphin calls in the first offering during the Sega logo and the title screen and end credits, respectively, the fucking better. To be fair, and forgive any double standards, here are my top 5 songs for both portable outings shown here. First, the original Echo on our left. And 
and for the tides of time on our right... Replay value-wise, while well, it stands to solid reason that neither of what we've been witnessing so far have any more to offer apart from the bare essentials, and in spite of the pillar of drastic changes that were imposed, at least the always intensified sense of challenges there, thanks to all the block mazes meant for not only scraping those dingy-ass spikes, but either keeping those fucking piss-ant piranha pricks at bay, or ceasing the rough currents in the second trek through the city of forever, as are the familiar occurrences we all admire and at times agonize or shock us to our very core. Therefore, as cheap as they are, pricing-wise, which I'll reveal at the very end, by the way, you'd be non compass mentis, not to mention mile-high on your own goddamn supply, to pass up the Echo Game Gear duology, as they're every bit as enthralling on that battery-draining, yet diminutive color screen as their console parents. Seriously, I'd give them a fucking whirl or two if I were you. Final exhibit, Echo the Dolphin, Defender of the Future, released for the Dreamcast six years later. I mean, Christ, talk about another first for this show. for this most recent entry, considering it's from over two decades ago for the record, is nothing short of a welcome, if unsurprisingly distant, departure from the main canon of the Genesis duology, complete with a somewhat promising backstory. Both humans and dolphins have been existing together for half a millennium, and have shared a common goal. What is that very goal, one might ask? The gift of unwavering peace and friendship, found only within the so-called Great Unknown. However, there is an opposing race that's on the search for that one place, but solely for aggression and domination. Case in point, the foe, definitely not the Vortex, during their constant battles against both the humans and dolphins, managed to annihilate and consume all life on Earth, thereby forcing the latter two species to retaliate against those outer space ass lickers. Thanks to their mechanical, parasurging, monolith-like creation, the Guardian, definitely not the Asterite. The foe is not only vanquished for a time, thus protecting both the humans and the dolphins, but also managed to plot their eventual vengeance against them. Just when almost all seemed bleak and lost, our iconic bottlenosed hero is called upon to yet again ensure the eternal extermination of his race's so-called foe. Don't believe me? Take it away, Tom Baker! And in this time of crisis, lived a young dolphin named Echo. He was destined to become the only hope for humans and dolphins. Echo, defender of Earth's future. With our noses firmly pressed yet again on the grindstone in terms of the gameplay aspect, as directly opposed to what we've been witnessing so far with the first two Echo offerings, Genesis CD Game Gear, who gives a shit? For if you include Junior on both Genesis and Pico, god forbid, despite once again not reviewing either. <laughs> This 3D Explorer is on an entirely new level, and of an entirely distinct breed all its own. You're once again in control of the heroic, adventure-hungry Terciops Terminator, hell for the nickname Scott to it if you get my drift, as he not only adapts to this new, if to the eyes of others all too familiar, and vast as the sun and moon's curvatures combine, string of environments, also trains and pushes himself to no end in order to achieve his ultimate goal of approaching and toppling the invading extraterrestrial foes, and prior to them, the everyday territorial types. Since this is a Dreamcast game we're dealing with here, the main analog joystick at the top left forces Echo to swim and migrate around to his gills' content, and the normal D-pad under that controls the camera. 
B commands him to dash and peck like before, A commands him to speed up while swimming, or hold down to maintain said speed, or slow him down upon releasing, X commands his trademark sonar ability not only to communicate with other creatures and or key items, or stun his adversaries whenever necessary, but also to summon the map upon holding it down, turning out to be either an aid or a distraction depending on one's own observations, and as a labor harness tractor beam later on by tapping it twice. Y allows him to perform a special maneuver, and depending on which control type you're experimenting with, the top left and right triggers, aka the Dreamcast own L and R, shifts the camera's view horizontally to both of these directions, and forces Echo to roll 180 degrees in either of these directions, in simultaneous conjunction with Y, or vice versa. Specifically, the view can be shifted left or right by pushing Y with the left trigger or right trigger simultaneously. Outside of the water, Echo's capable of not only diving back in after replenishing his air, but also having his view rotated via A or B at either a slower or faster pace individually, ceasing said rotation via X, and chirping in or smirking for the sake of showing off via Y. As expected of any follow-up to any franchise ever, whether still thriving, alive and kicking if you will, or long since dormant, despite what we've been experiencing thus far winding up in the fucking ladder bracket, there are traditional features including 5 sonar songs that'll affect other supporting and or opposing organisms, 5 gifts of power that'll advance Echo's overall physical attributes and abilities via the crystals that he acquires. <laughs> and the Vitalic Crystals that extend Echo's health meter over time, thereby making his latest odyssey more a major cakewalk than an aggravating-ass shit show, and then some. But more on these later. Should Echo run out of health from excessive damage, or lingering underwater too long, as per usual, and for the very last fucking time, refer to the importance of reaching the surfaces and air pockets, or calling out to the clams, whenever and wherever possible, you're taken to the continue screen with a countdown, and upon pushing start, his trails continue from there, However, if said counter reaches zero, it's a one-way ticket back to the introductory menu, complete with your pre-saved data in terms of every important, recently acquired in-game prize being logged on the console's VMU, or virtual memory unit, but you're forced to restart a certain stage from the ground up. All the usual barebone stipulations aside, Echo starts off his latest quest in Aquamarine Bay with maneuvering lessons from the instructor while shooting the shit with him and the other dolphins via the trusty old sonar techniques, complete with a fish fetching ground with a coach and the surrounding dolphins, which results in being awarded one of the five Vitalic Crystals. The remaining four are discovered within the vicinity, but require the keenest of reflexes and memory to accomplish these feats. <laughs> There's even an undersea landscape in the area, comprised of more than just spires, arches, and boulders. A long, extremely stretched out path of pink gray rocks for easier navigation throughout sums up the main attraction, far northwest of which leads to an ancient, pre-sealed entrance to Atlantis, and the open ocean is located east of the bay. Unfortunately, both are off fucking limits, due to both an important key element for later and strong ocean currents, respectively. And don't get me started with the lost baby orca that gets trapped underneath the rocks following yet another infamous earthquake, tapped by one of the Guardian's broken shards. Of course, you have to chat with both the coach and the mom in advance before uniting and collaborating with the dolphin players and tail swimming ahead of them. Following the bay is where shit gets even more fucked up. The so-called Perils of the Coral Reef marks the return of those infuriating-ass sharks, for which you need both the Song of the Shark and the Power of Vigor, more of which you'll discover down the road, more like throughout the season in this case, just like the fucking Vitalic Crystals, for better sonar distraction against them and an advanced charging attack, respectively. In which case, you're better off either using the normal headbutt strategy while maintaining your bearings, or just flat-out avoiding their dangerous asses. <laughs> 
son of a bitch! <laughs> By the cunt of Kim fucking Kardashian! <laughs> Como se llama? <laughs> Kelly Clarkson! <laughs> In your face, dildo! <laughs> Piss right off, cum bucket! Booyah! All while reuniting two lost dolphin brothers and saving the pet turtle of one of them, both of whom teach Echo the aforementioned Song of the Shark, and later other songs that will cause the turtles and fish schools to follow him. Catching an impossible fish in order to learn one of said important songs, performing said song toward a school of reliable piranhas, before venturing through the cave to repel the more aggressive types. facing off against a massive as fuck great white. For the sake of trapping that sharp-toothed prick in one of the tunnels in the rock tower on the other side of the cave, upon distracting his ass via sonar and leading it through before not only finally snatching the power of Vigor Crystal, but also finally toppling that son of a bitch before it devours your ass like a goddamn Long John Silver's appetizer, and I don't even need to mention how many times I had to go through the ladder. <laughs> ah, Bob Saget! Send my fucking regards to Brody and Quint, you oversized piss ant. And using that same time power of vigor ability to acquire the one and only Vitalic Crystal near a raging waterfall current and pass through an earlier inaccessible path containing yet another strong ass current. <laughs> Trial without error involves Echo taking on an even more massive wave of sharks before reaching the octopus's cave and meeting up yet again with one of the dolphin brothers from earlier while evading said octopus and its ensuing remorseless threats. <laughs> Four ways of mystery, hence the name, there are three of four possible passageways Echo must traverse through in order to not only acquire the power of air, hence Echo's second gift, which extends his oxygen meter underwater by twice his normal interim, and a few special and specific colored crystals to access each path. <laughs> but also a bubble vent to regain his oxygen, and a dolphin that'll teach you the Song of the Ray, for which to keep both the stingrays and manta rays off your ass at every turn. Revisitations of Scenes 2 and 3, specifically the very same Perils of the Coral Reef and Trial Without Error, except Echo learns the power of sonar to break rocks akin to tides of time, and even confronts a wave of the more resilient Hammerhead Sharks, who make the normal sharks look like Flipper's meth addict's grandsons, not to mention the poisonous-ass jellyfish which caused Echo to be severely affected upon any run-in, in which case he should only rely on an antidote fish, despite the extreme ladder being rare as Castlevania Dracula X, pricing-wise, that is.
up and down where the Power of Endurance item is introduced, temporarily doubling Echo's health even more while avoiding a hazardous red rock before pursuing the Power of Air and knocking a brown boulder into an alcove with another raging current. Amongst many that force vertical directions depending on the types Echo's bound to endure within the immediate undersea area, forces, which involves Echo confronting and or evading even more of those fierce as fuck razor jawed ass munching sharks and vengeful cock stained shit for brains moray eels, while maintaining the possession of the power of stealth throughout. <laughs> Atlantis Lost, where Echo consults with a Guardian, with the latter tapping him to collect five crystals while swimming through countless hoops, trenches, and the like. All before the start of the following three chapters, Man's Nightmare featuring seven scenes, Dolphin's Nightmare featuring 12 scenes, one of which involves a revisit and another involving three parts, and the ultimate five-scene finale, Domain of the Foe, where Echo at last approaches the dark, non-terrestrial menaces of the universe and exterminates them head-on. But, as per usual, I wouldn't at the very least expect an instantaneous milk run out of what we're witnessing here, cause trust me when I express that you'll be extremely perplexed than every main male character in every ETU video ever made. I'm glaring at you especially, Milton, Dante Hicks from Clerks 1-3, through 3, with regards to Brian O'Howard in case he's watching this, and Hiroshi Ohira from Refreshing Stories Combined, and every common and advanced obstacle alike Echo attempts to outlast the ever-loving shit out of, will trip your ass up more often than a goddamn bar exam, thereby draining every minute of your precious time, you won't stand any fucking chance of getting back WHATSO MOTHERFUCKING EVER! In spite of how antsy and convoluted the controls can be at certain intervals, case in point, upon readjusting the camera or when recovering from any opposing hostile party damage, Echo swims as if he's been possessed by Davy fucking Jones, not to mention how awkward and inaccurate the aiming can become when confronting every foe throughout. They're nothing short of competent and adaptable to get the ultimate all-seeing gist of, likewise for the constant, if dramatically and frivolously evolved, gameplay procedure. Challenge-wise, Defender of the Future should come as no surprise whatsoever, considering the first few scenes are at the very least tolerable enough for one to adapt to, while doing more than just kicking ass, taking names, and accumulating one crucial prize after another, except with an underwater twist. But in the case of the later trials, to paraphrase the cable guy, it's also a kick in the face on a Saturday night with a steel toe grip Kodiak work boot and a trip to the hospital bloodied and bashed for reconstructive surgery. More than ever, I shit everyone not, and as is the case with the previous offerings, your keenest intuition, sharpest senses, highest level of confidence, and infinite patience are mandatory as all get out in order to survive every out of nowhere danger and accomplish every Herculean task imaginable if you're to stand any glittering chance of having Echo live up to his best in title, especially when throwing your hat over the wall, hence Randallgrave saying, definitely not mine. In other words, risking one's ass, for the lack of a better expression, to master and put to ultimate practice all the five gifts of power, vigor, air, sonar, stealth, and endurance, plus the signs meant for other creatures and organisms in order for them to bend to your every will or be made your eternal bitch in submission to Leviathan, the shark, the turtle, the fish, the ray, and the plant, while not overwhelming yourself with one time-consuming ordeal after another, like guiding the second and final ray to the main cave via sonar in four ways of mystery for the sole purpose of keeping the goddamn Mori Eel's asses at bay. Not to fucking mention outwitting that bitch-ass Prime Mover in the Shrine of Controversy before uniting her with the two other dolphins, namely the Grey Shaded Circle and the Crimson, to open the gates of said shrine and possessing the Labor Harness, with which to operate machines via sonar by tapping X twice, as I've just specified earlier. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
surviving through the highly fortified water tubes and hanging waters, and even standing your fucking ground against the often abominable as shit extraterrestrial foes in their concluding domain, amongst many. Aside from everything else, refer to what I discuss about the continue screen and the VMU loading and saving functions, which work about the same way as the RAM card for the Saturn, and even the memory cards for the PS1, PS2, and the like. Ditto for every other hint I've been heavily advocating up until this point, none of which will be continuously fucking reiterated ever again. I don't even need to elaborate further on how much the graphical presentation underwent an unprecedented-ass improvement from its predecessors, as what we've experienced, and have been experiencing, thus far, speaks volumes upon volumes for itself, and then some. Even for a Dreamcast title released midway through the console's lifespan, over half a year prior to its forthcoming, inevitable extinction to be exact, all random fact-checking aside, each and every immersive environment was crafted and embedded to the liveliest perfection many can't help but dream endlessly over, thereby cementing their standards miles above those of its neighboring predecessors. Regarding Echo himself, as usual, not to mention the numerous organisms he interacts with and or confronts depending on the situations at hand, they appear to be way more fluid and lifelike in comparison to their previous two exploits, save for that choppy-looking-ass octopus at the end of Trial Without Error, god forbid. And that's no shit either. And the less I convey about the variations in lighting, considering the realism approach that the ill-fated Appalooza, formerly Novitrade, and Sega were attempting to go for, especially the dark-ass sections of certain caves and seas, where the visual perceptions are limited even to the naked eyes of most, or for lack of a more direct and simplified result, one could barely see cock all, the better. Notwithstanding that, the variety of atmospheric scenes, whether as cutscenes or actual stages, are anything but barren and long-winded, and I'd be bullshitting worse than the homeless veteran from Terry Gilliam's The Fisher King, portrayed by a pre-mystery man Tom Waits, I might add, if I were to express otherwise. In the music and sound department, orchestrated by Tim Fallon, responsible for numerous software creations developed games, including Solstice, Silver Surfer, Spider-Man X-Men Arcade's Revenge, and the like, alongside his brother Jeff, G-E-O-F-F to be precise, in collaboration with Attila Hager of Konami's Contra Legacy of War and Sea of the Contra Adventure, and even the Lost World Jurassic Park on Genesis, also for Sega. The also immersive plethora of songs don't disappoint by any means whatsoever either, despite their obvious, albeit sparse, superfluity. Each and every accompanying song accentuates the manifold scenic, cosmic, and near extraterrestrial surroundings alike, in tandem with the accompanying events when Echo confronts or approaches an intense situation, thanks entirely to the assortment of fervors each of them exhibit, running the gamut from optimistic and lively, even heroic, depending on the score, to downright ominous and fear-mongering beyond imagination. The also accompanying realistic sound effects are nothing short of satisfactory either, including but not limited to the calls of various creatures, not just Echo and his own kind, let alone the heterogeneous hodgepodge of species-based allies and rivals he respectively consorts with and encounters, of course. And how can anyone possibly go wrong with Tom Baker's ominous narrations during the concomitant cutscenes in between every chain of stages? Echo restored the Guardian, but he was too late for the foe started their descent. Determined to conquer Earth. By creating a temporal vortex, they opened a portal through time. And to prevail in the present, the foe would alter Earth's past. Stealing their intelligence, their ambition, their compassion, wisdom, and humility. Robbing dolphins of their future. And once more, before I proceed any further, take note of my top 10 songs listed here. This time with seven, I shit you not, seven honorable mentions included. Replayability-wise, despite my skepticism in terms of the Herculean effort and time it'll take to master this more than two decades old reboot, not to mention the commonly raved about flaws, including but not limited to the obtuse nature in terms of attempting to shoot the shit with other supporting, if at times antagonistic, creatures, proceeding to other amicable domains without being stuck in the same fucking sub-area, and maintaining Echo's advanced attributes apart from the usual resources, and considering both how far the franchise has come even at this juncture, not to mention how extremely fucking pestering the gameplay procedure and difficulty can become at times. 
There's no doubt in one's own subconscious, mine included, I might add, that you'll be skinny dipping, submerging, and revealing every hidden enigma of Echo, Defender of the Future, time and again. And did I somehow forget to mention there's even a PS2 port by the long since defunct Acclaim Entertainment? Not to mention the cancelled yet somehow drastically improved potential follow-up of which a prototype exists for the record. Sentinels of the Universe, despite the latter being abandoned due to the Dreamcast's discontinuation, Henceforth, in the most coherent, forthright summation one could possibly deliver, what's my final verdict? By now, it should be yet another shot in the dark cinch why such a pivotal and inspirational franchise as this has been perceived as such for many a generation, taking its undeniably radiant plethora of ambiances and its dead set, no bullshit learning curves into account in rigorous amalgamation with the often vexatious and imposing difficulty levels, the latter of which takes those earlier recounted traits to work one's own way around to a point where they become nothing short of satisfactory and governable. Also, there are absolutely no words to convey my immortal recognition for the legacy that Echo has left behind, considering it's been 23 years since its dormant status, thereby summarily dismissing that Sentinels of the Universe prototype sequel. On the usual scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate them all. results set in stone, and for the very last time, in spite of the minor yet noticeable shortcomings they encompass, technical or otherwise, all are worthy of everything this mysteriously forgotten yet somehow memorable Tersiap's Terminator embodies, as have many mascot characters regardless of popularity level. Bottom line, you'd be non compass mentis as a motherfucker to skip out on the Echo the Dolphin franchise, as their pricing range is nothing short of manageable and dirt cheap, with Defender of the Future teetering on the edge of highway robbery territory, shit if not already there, precisely between 8, if a skosh less, to 51 bucks. And allow me to assure you one and all, there should be no ounce of lament or discomfort in experiencing everything these three oceanic odysseys are about, thereby defying even Sequest DSV and the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Until then, one and all, considering the agonizing monthly delays due to any irrelevant commitments on my part, which I more than deeply regret, many thanks for watching, listening, tuning in, and be on the lookout for my Season 8 premiere, which will be arriving around 2024. This is the one and only Hardcore Retro God once again triumphantly signing off. <laughs>